Hello and welcome uh, to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program here at the School of Visual Arts. I'm Michael Foley and I'm going to be your host for this evening. Uh, after the talk we will be having a question and answer so if you could just hold your questions until after that that would be great. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce our guest speaker Raheem Fortune. Uh, Raheem was raised in Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma. His documentary photo practice focuses on culture geography, and self-expression in the American landscape. His book, I Can't Stand to See You Cry, explores Texas and the surrounding states and the people fixed within its complex landscape. Fortune analyzes relationships between family and friends, strangers, all caught in the flood of health, uh, all, I'm sorry, all caught in the, in the flood of health and environmental issues while working to maintain grace. Through an approach rooted in landscape, the artist uses his experience to explore the friction between public and private life and unspoken tensions in daily life. Moreover, Fortune's biographical approach to photography attempts to unpack his own identity and experience amid a pandemic, civil unrest, a cross-country move, a career, and the loss of a parent, thinking of both future and the past. His book was nominated for the Perry Photo Aperture Photo Book of the Year and was listed as one of the Museum of Modern Art's favorite photo books of 2021. Let's welcome Raheem Fortune. Hello, everybody. I'm microphone, do I need a, I'm all good to go? Okay, perfect. Um, thank you, Michael, for that introduction. And also, yeah, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, you know, I don't take for granted just sharing this physical space together, especially given the past couple of years that we've had. So I typically just like to acknowledge that first and foremost, that yeah, gratitude, yeah, to share this moment together in person and not virtually. So thank you guys all for being here. Um, so I guess just structure, I like to give the structure of what the talk is going to give. So it helps both of us, I believe. Um, so I'm going to start with my, um, my coming into photography. Um, as Michael said, I was raised in the Chickasaw Nation, which is a small tribal community in Oklahoma. Um, so my mother being Chickasaw, my father being black, African-American from Virginia, Texas, ultimately just the South um, family kind of a product of um, wartime during the late 60s. And so a lot of these kind of um, effects of, you know, um, upper mobility, American exceptionalism were all kind of built into the making of family in um, the generation and geographical region I grew up in. So I'll kind of speak to how that influenced my uh, introduction to photography. Um, from there, I'll go in. So with that, I want to acknowledge that there's a lot of students in the room and also kind of uh, photographers who have certain questions about industry or career trajectory. So I'm going to try to touch on some of that as well and not just like be intellectual and like mysterious about everything. Um, <laughs> And so uh, I'll use that first bit to kind of speak about self-publishing versus working with a major publisher, which as uh, Michael said, I worked with Loose Joints to publish a, a book. So it was a very different experience to self-publishing. Um, and then from there, I'll speak about a few assignments where I've kind of used that same approach that I um, discovered and employed with my personal practice and how that kind of can translate into a career or assignment work um, for people who are curious about how you can make money as a photographer doing what you love and kind of not having to compromise and just take on anything, which is kind of a necessary part of what we do inherently, but just showing my way of how I use those same tools. Um, and so, yeah, we'll end it with um, a kind of work in progress uh, film that I produce with a collaborator of mine. And then from there, we'll open it up to questions. Um, so Oklahoma was my first a substantial body of work. Um, this work, I started making this in probably around 2015. And so I moved away from Oklahoma in the eighth grade. That was 2007, after the loss of my mother. Um, so my mother passed away in 2007, and for about 10 to 11 years, I would not return to Oklahoma. So this period of my life would almost become a bit of a fever dream. It was something that only I and my sister had um, 
exact reference to. No one else in my family had really lived with my mother in this period in Oklahoma, nor did any of my friends know where I came from. And so it kind of became this memory. And so when I was 23, able to rent a car, I traveled to Oklahoma to begin unpacking what had happened there. My grandmother was still there. She lived in a house that was built on our tribal land by her husband. And she kind of be her house in the town kind of become the central figures of the book. Um, and so, you know, I guess kind of getting into how, my interest in photography, when I started making this work, I had already moved to New York from Texas. And I was looking at the work of artists who I found very inspirational. You know, a few of them that I often cite are um, Robert Adams. He has a book called Summer Nights Walking. And when I looked at that, this book and saw the way that he kind of translated landscapes that reminded me of home and where I grew up in, it really struck me that what I grew up seeing could be art. And it also felt uh, brought a profound sense of comfort in seeing images, um, like I said, that reminded me of home being brought to the level of fine art. So. You know, Frank Golke is another artist. Um, George Tice is another person. And these kind of older, you know, master printers who would just make these kind of melancholy, stark images of the American landscape, it really moved me. And so I guess a theme throughout this I kind of speak to is this, the way that photography sometimes will allow you or give you a reason to embrace hardship because as much as, you know, it was like this virtuous thing of like, oh, I wanted to go to Oklahoma and heal and reconcile. It was also like, hey, I think there might be a picture out there. And that's totally fine because two things can be true at once. And so throughout my work, photography allows me to look a little bit deeper, to go a little bit closer and um, in maybe somewhat of a transactionary nature. And so I don't um, sugarcoat that part of it as far as ha going and embracing these things and having something kind of come in return. Um, because a lot of these things would be difficult otherwise, and a lot of my family members who didn't have um, an art form to be working with, they never really em encountered these things. But I do believe that healing is something that happens kind of in a very um, subconscious way. So when you heal, it has a healing effect around you. And so I really do think that making these photographs, making these documents and this statement does have an effect for my entire family and hopefully other people who relate to the images. Um, so when I, when I started to go out, I was very kind of naive in my approach, but I don't want to write myself off as being uninformed. Um, so I was looking at influences and, you know, navigating these scenes that I grew up seeing. And so this bridge here kind of divides Texas and Oklahoma. And so growing up between these two states, this was always a big marker of crossing this bridge and kind of going between these two worlds of Texas and Oklahoma. Um, so when I came back, like I said, it had been 11 years. So to see trees that you grew up playing around, they weren't new, but they, they also weren't necessarily familiar. And so that was kind of the essence of what I wanted to photograph with this project. So scenes like my grandmother's kind of aging bedroom, um, sites of my sister helping to fix supper, which is kind of the, you know, vernacular of Oklahoma, fixing supper, you know, you might have a can of pop if you're feeling wild. So it's just capturing these very kind of small town um, things because my grandmother, she never, she never got internet. She still lived in the like TV guide, you know, brochures in the mail and that was entertainment as well as having this connection to this deeper history of growing up in probably 1950s Oklahoma as a young native girl and experiencing all of these plethoras of interpersonal politics, also the hardships that are associated with that, and also just her own personal uh, troubles. And so I listen to all of these stories very deeply and a lot of that informed the images. And so even in a picture like this, you know, my sister and I being few of the only uh, black identifying children in this school had a very hard time. Um, even the tribe that we, belo that we belong to um, has a history of slavery. And so it was not like, just a necessarily like an accepting environment. And so to me, I've, I always looked at being able to go back to this place and make art about it as a form of power in that it like, it was very dignified in doing that. And even when making the pictures, I felt very, it felt healing to be there making art, to have that luxury because so much about this place is um, circumstance outside of your control. So to be there and to have that control while making images felt redemptive to say the least. Um, 
So also kind of slower moments, my grandmother became very interested in making jewelry. And so for her final years, she was in the, this house in the woods by herself making jewelry. And so every time I would come, I would leave with a lot of gifts for friends and family. Kind of showing the withered nature of the towns. There's like maybe three towns that kind of create Cole County and that's where I grew up. So this is Colgate, Oklahoma, with what once was probably a beautiful mural um, in a more lively town. So we're talking about a place that lost population since the 70s. Like this was once a more populous place, small houses with families living in them that have now kind of succumbed to um, b big energy, um, cattle land, and kind of corporate interest. So where you would once have um, so I, like a house like this would have once stood and housed a family. Now it's kind of just bigger plots of land, like I said. And even within my own family land, they weren't able to retain the land. So after my grandmother passed away, our native land is no longer within our own family. Um, so that was also something that wasn't necessarily on the front of my mind when making this work. But the nature of photography, so much of it is about what the photos present to you after time. Um, so yes, you know, this is the largest employer in the town. This is the concrete plant. Um, and so kind of just navigating through the space, I would come and it, like I said, it gave me a reason to visit my grandmother. So I would go visit her and I would kind of go around, make a series of pictures and each time come back and kind of have something to look at. Um, this is a photo of my grandmother with her dogs going to fetch the um, comforter off of the clothesline. Um, kind of more subtle moments of um, the, the natural beauty that is surrounding it, um, as well as some of the kind of decay and how those two things kind of exist at the same time. And it's kind of a matter of perspective. What catches your attention? Is it the hard thing? Is it the beauty? How do you, how do you um, posture yourself to this place? And so much of that was um, apparent to me. And my grandmother would recall when these places were new. I mean, she, when I showed her this picture in particular, she said, I remember when that place opened, they had great fried chicken. So never got to try the chicken, but you know, um, really just fascinating. And so much of this, this um, crossroad, it just sits in a town as you start to leave and they're just so fixated to memory. Um, you know, this is like my Walker Evans photo. It's kind of just like as I'm showing, as I'm kind of learning more about pictures, I'm seeing Walker Evans in these FSA approach and how he would photograph interior details. And I'm like, wow, my grandma's house still kind of looks like that. Like I can, that's a picture. And kind of literally just one-to-one -one figuring out how to make a, a, an image that works. Um, this is a photograph of my uncle. Um, he is my, the middle child, my grandmother's like middle child. Um, you know, and he did a lot of time incarcerated. Um, and has dealt with alcoholism for a, a good part of his life. And so this tattoo was actually, um, he was made in prison while he was incarcerated. And this was during a time when he's home. So this photo is titled Uncle's Back. Um, and it's kind of a play on words because he was in and out of incarceration for much of our, our lives. Um, yeah, again, just photographing naturally while there. Um, and I guess kind of speaking to, like I said, the difference between um, publishing with the big publisher versus self-publishing. Um, you know, for me, I often quote uh, Zora Hurston, who uh, once said, a, a story is a terrible thing to keep inside. And I really do believe that there's truth to that, that sometimes it is about like a story that's within you is like bursting out of the seams. And I, you know, one time I told one of my collaborators and curators or mentors that, you know, if I listen to your advice, this project would never come out. And so I have to do it my way because I have to put it out there. And I think a lot of young artists maybe relate to that in the sense that like, I'm just ready for this to be out. And I think that that does have its shortcomings because that project is gonna age with you. Um, and you're gonna have to kind of constantly answer to it. It's gonna kind of be there with you as your first book. And so that is something to think of as your you know, taste level, but also your um, skill set increases. You wanna make sure that you have uh, a document of your work that ages gracefully. But you know, again, speaking to this nature of timeliness, sometimes that is, it's not about that. You don't have another 10 years to perfect this or X amount of money to um, hire freelance designers. And it's about doing something intuitive. So I'm not here to make a case for or against self-publishing, but more so saying some of the shortcomings I've had. Because another thing that I've had with this project in particular is that I'll show it to people who I admire a lot and 
it's like, I always say good pictures, bad book. It's like, I like the photographs, but the way that I sequenced it, I was too knowledgeable about every intricate detail of these pictures, so that informed how I laid it out, and that to an uninformed viewer does not translate any of that feeling. It's like, for me, I'm looking at the book and it's like, oh, well, this is my, this is this house, and when you look across the street, it's that house. Well, to someone who does not know that, that isn't very unimportant, and so, thinking about sequencing in a way that is a little bit more objective and thinking more about translating your true um, feelings and what your goals are with the work to a viewer. Um, and obviously, like it's not creating for the viewer, but thinking about how will this be interpreted by someone with no context. Um, so yeah, I, I worked on these photographs until 2020 and right around the time that the pandemic hit, I was planning on going back to do more work and that's when things really shut down. And I first made the book simply for myself as a document just to have for myself and to look at, but when I received the dummy, I was happy with it enough to want it to go out into the world. And having people see that, it kind of went back to what I was saying about that feeling of no one, no one knowing about this place where I grew up, because this is a strip, like looking from my grandmother's house down, I lived in a small single wide trailer across this hill. And so it's like I made a landscape photo and I revisit this today and actually like it. And uh, it's just literally the street where I grew up and I was just very moved that that was even able to produce a picture, but also that I have that now that my grandmother has passed away, the land is no longer ours, like this photograph is still mine and it, it still reminds me of, yeah, the many times like riding bikes or horses down this very dirt road. Um, and you know, I also, I have ancestors who are buried on this ground. You know, my great grandmother, um, her sister um, who passed during childbirth is buried on the plot adjacent to my grandmother. So there's so much family history here. And I guess the kind of last thing I'll say about self-publishing, because I self-published, my grandmother was able to see this book in her lifetime. And had I gone like the intellectual, like rigorous route, that would have never happened. And so I was really grateful that I was able to share that moment with my grandmother and she was able to look at this, um, to look at this book and kind of see what those years did to me and kind of see it through my eyes. And it was a great unspoken thing. Um, so we get to this next project where um, I had been making photographs in Texas where my father was living for, for many years since I first picked up the camera, which would have been around 2014, 2015. And so in 2020, my father was, well, I guess in 2019, my father was diagnosed with ALS, which is a, degener a neurological degenerative disorder, um, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, but it essentially, your body just breaks down and your nerves just stop working. So this man who was like, a black belt in Taekwondo and such a strong like grandfather and father to um, you know four children he essentially his body shut down on him and you know it was really difficult at first people would ask me like oh are you making any work about this and I would say ah oh, you know actually no I, I'm not you know it's it's really tough like he doesn't look well all the time it's a little bit tense you know a lot of the settings well when the pandemic started and things shut down, I actually, I happened to be visiting him at the time. And during this time, I thought that I was truly gonna have to leave New York, where I was starting to get some kind of editorial acclaim, and people were starting to pay a little bit more mind to my work. Um, I thought I was gonna have to leave New York, where I had been s assisting, because I think that's also an important context. I was assisting commercial photographers for quite some time, um, learning more about the photo industry and making connections. So it wasn't just happening in this vacuum. I also wanna contextualize that I was, a part of a kind of larger ecosystem of photography and assistance and conversation that's I think New York is very great for. Um, but I, I decided that I wasn't going to leave and that instead of going back, I was just going to go forward and do both. And so I still now to this day split my time between Texas and New York. And so that I guess would be the start of that. But I would do that much to the help of my younger sister who would take on a greater workload of caregiving for my father so that I could continue making my pictures, which now was to a great benefit because it really has changed like my family dynamic and it's so much great things have come from that work that I did. So I like to thank my sister. Um, on the cover is a photograph of uh, my girlfriend, Miranda and I, who, she's here, hi Miranda. <laughs> mm. So, you know, fast forward, getting into the book, um, you know, <clears throat> Loose Joints reached out to me in 2020 and they asked me if I had anything that I had been working on. I had um, published a few things that had gotten their attention. They were curious if I had anything that could potentially be a book project. Um, 
and publishers often do this. They look for upcoming projects, they look for projects to develop. Um, and so that's, you know, also for, us, you know, up and coming photographers is a great thing to know that just starting conversations with the publishers, it doesn't have to be this like transactional thing where I want to do a book with you. Just starting a conversation because the knowledge that you can gain from them as well as just the perspective on how that whole like, um, like infrastructure works can be really helpful. So don't think that like publishing it with the big publisher is unattainable. It's just a conversation as I think most productive things in photography are. They're not um, so like gig based in my opinion. They're a conversation and using photography as a true tool of communication and sharing the human experience is really what I'm most interested in with photography um, but let me not get sidetracked so they reach out to me and they ask me what I'm working on and my initial idea was uh, a series of interior photographs depicting the kind of labor of caregiving during the pandemic I think that we every photographer had a bad pandemic project idea um, when it has first started uh, so that I think that was kind of where I was stuck at early on and so loose joints was like listen this is really great I like what you're where you're going but we want to see everything that you ever shot in Texas. And so then I was kind of tasked with going through and making contact, digital contact sheets of everything I had ever shot from Texas, which was about five to six years worth of photographs. And they were able to help me shape a project that was more linear and more, um, I guess a little bit more universal than my initial idea of just depicting caregiving and the um, a, dealing with a parent who has a you know a terminal illness, um, and they kind of shaped this project that to me, as you know stated in the intro, speaks to the plethora of things that I was dealing with. One of them being um, a long-term relationship, a long-distance relationship during the pandemic while uh, caring for an ailing father, which is just the ultimate test of love and endurance, as well as um, the anxieties of having a, like a burgeoning career that's kind of um, happening, um, as well as the political things that are happening in Texas. This is during the time of COVID. This is during the time of um, the protest, which were particularly um, big in Austin because right around the time that George Floyd was killed, a man named Mike Ramos was also murdered by the police in Austin. So it was really this kind of like, fever boil moment in um, Texas where so many things were clashing. And I mean, to this day, it's no different. The state is still very fractured and there's so much, um, you know, uh, political, but also environmental things that um, we're really just starting to see the true ugliness of their potentials. And so this was right around that time when so many of those things were starting. And I guess I'm gonna show the photos from the book, but I'm actually gonna play them to a song. And so I'll get to this, the, the pictures here in a moment. Um, but yeah, so I guess the other thing that's important to say is during this time I did a photo essay for, the, for Rolling Stone magazine. And in this essay, I wanted to push back against the protest images that I was seeing at the time. I felt like a lot of photojournalists were like kind of cooped up during the pandemic and when the protest started, it was like, oh yes, historic thing to go out and photograph. So you kind of saw this rush to reaction from publications and from photographers depicting these kind of very reactionary, very um, kind of like agitative images of protesting. And I wanted to get at something that was a little bit deeper um, of the issue. And so I decided to focus on individual narratives of people in Austin in a city where I had already been making work about the kind of racialized um, discrimination as well as a racial that is kind of intrinsic in a post Jim Crow city, which Austin is. Um, you know, it's, there's, there's so much there that has really been uh, strategically hidden as far as like redlining and urban renewal that's really left Austin in a really rough place uh, for black community. And so these were things that I had been working on and interested in. And so to see these kind of like very um, simplified narratives and images really like struck me as counterproductive to an ultimate goal of, you know, agency and political agency, personal agency. And so, you know, I focused on things like um, young parents who were dealing with the strained medical infrastructure of COVID who, you know, already deal with higher um, cases of, um, you know, birth, birth uh, morbidity and things like that, as well as my sister who has three kids um, who was uh, dealing with the homeschooling at the time, as well as people affected by, um, the riot munitions that were deployed during the riots. And so there was so many things that were happening around me. And so um, much of that photo essay would kind of form the backbone of this book. And you know, then there's kind of these memory sequences that like I said, go back as early as 2015. Um, 
So I worked with loose joints to put all of that kind of craziness into one sequence of photographs that read legibly as a singular project. And I, I typically live by like this rule that I don't like my photographs to present questions that they don't answer. And so that's kind of something that I live by in the way of sequencing in narrative arc within sequences of images. Like I can't add an image that's going to take you way off because it's like a, a spider web that must be contained and everything kind of every start must have a finish. And so that kind of helped me to go from like a 400 images to chop it down to a smaller edit, like what works. Some of it is aesthetic, some of it is conceptual. You need breaks, it can't be all big moments. And so working on this project really, really taught me a lot of lessons about sequencing and editing and how to form a project, which was much to the help of Loose Joints, who had such an incredible um, record of publication. Um, so the title, I Can't Stand to See You Cry, is taken from a song, which I will play with the sequence. And so during this time, caregiving for my father, he was actually um, a funk drummer. So he was a funk musician all through his like teenage years. And, you know, I grew up going to his shows. And so this kind of late 60s soul music kind of was, you know, like the almost like the soundtrack to my family history in a way you know it's like my grandfather who was a GI there's all these like incredible like almost leave it to beaver story esque stories of him and like just this kind of brought up in this almost playing on um, I don't really want to say propaganda but the way that we um, perform memory in the way that we you know selectively choose what things of the past we want to honor um, and so I think that so much of that with my grandparents and this, like I said, this idea of kind of American exceptionalism really fascinated me. So that's another common thread through the project is how we perform history. And I think that it was really fascinating for like the ability of people of color to also participate in the idea of like fantasy and for it not to always be rooted back to some form of oppression or destitute, servitude, but to be able to embrace the landscape and participate in a creative production that isn't wed to a narrative of hardship, you know? And so that is also very interesting for me to have a full transparent um, collaboration with the people who I'm photographing and that it becomes more of um, a two-way like relationship versus me just going and kind of taking from unknown other. It's very much a production of my community. Um, so thank you for getting through all of that. I'll go ahead and just play the photographs and stop talking for a little bit.
Yeah, so that essentially is the, is the sequence of the book, uh, 58 totals and uh, 58 images in total. And um, I haven't gotten like a cool DJ way to like cut that track out, but hopefully in the next presentation <laughs> we can mix it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, the music became a very central thing to the project. And I can go through and kind of speak to a couple of um, images in particular. Um, you know, I would get time away from taking care of my father and I would have these songs that I would travel and listen to and they became the soundtrack to what I was dealing with. They became the soundtrack to the landscape I was looking at, but also sometimes an unspoken language between my father and I. So there would be certain songs, Always and Forever being one in particular, that I knew that him and my mother listened to a lot. So it was kind of like if I played this song around him, it was kind of like, let's talk about it. But we didn't have to say any words because the song kind of allowed all of that frequency and things to be brought to the surface. And so that this book is really tied to the music. Um, and yeah, a lot of the people, there's only two street portraits in this where, you know, I was photographing strangers, but often they were to kind of represent people who I frequented in passing, you know, if it was at the skate park or, you know, at a gas station, but this kind of, um, you know, this kind of acknowledgement that went both ways of interest in young people um, and their stories. So yeah, you know, putting this sequence together, there's things that people will tell me about the pictures that I didn't even recognize and I really love that. Um, you know, one in particular is this sequence of photographs here. Um, never struck my mind, but this photograph was actually taken at a ministry that was um, held for the homeless in Austin, which Austin has a, a very large homeless problem. Um, or I don't even want to say problem, but um, you know, there's a lot of unhoused people in Austin. Um, and some of that has um, dynamics that, you know, speak to the same kind of uh, unequal footing in Austin. And also was a thing early on, this might be one of the oldest pictures in the book, but it was something that I, I needed to understand more. So I didn't really set out to photograph unhoused people, but there was no way that I could ignore what was happening in my city and how I was seeing like, you know, people who looked like me, the condition that they were in, in Austin. And so one of the earliest things with photography was like exploring and understanding that. But someone looked at this photograph and they got something completely different. And what they read it as was that this man was at a union meeting and that the following sequence would then represent this idea of kind of toxic workplace. This would kind of represent like leisure, leaving with um, friends and you kind of see this um, sprawl of kind of gas and water and, ho and like, you know, uh, long term stay hotel like and none of that was like, you know, I just made this picture as these gentlemen passed me on the highway and then followed by this picture, which also kind of speaks back to labor and um, you know, how that's tied to economic mobility. Um, and that was something that I didn't, when we sequenced it, that wasn't necessarily the decision, but I liked it. So I, I, I will kind of go with it now. I'm like, hey, I li I, you, you might be onto something. And I think that having that openness with your pictures is really important. Um, and kind of back to what I said is like not thinking of them as so literal, which was kind of a shortcoming in sequencing my first book. Um, but yeah, so, you know, it was really great. People often ask, oh, how do the people feel about the photographs? I really don't like to make pictures of people that they don't like. So if I make a photo of someone, I hope that you like it and that you feel it represents who you are. And I hope that like to not have to make like two versions of a picture to appease the person that is sitting for me and myself so that you know, when this project comes together, every person is happy with how they're represented. It's not a kind of mean critique, but there is room for nuance. Um, so my family has had a good reception to it. My, the people who appear in the photographs have had a great reception to it. Um, and yeah, it feels good to be able to make this timestamp of where I grew up. Um, and so yeah, you know, this project definitely changed my life in many ways. Um, I can go to the end here. So this summer, the show was uh, in Arles, France for the Arles Festival. Um, and this, this project uh, won me the, the Louis Rutter Discovery Prize, um, which was a, a massive honor. And so 
kind of using scale, I took this project from the book to the wall. And so by using various scales, as well as the kind of light wood to, in a way, kind of brighten the images, because I, you know, showing this in a French context, I didn't want people to be like tiptoeing around the pictures, like, oh my gosh, it's, this seems so rough, you know, especially in the regards to like my friend who was injured by the police, as well as the photo of my ailing father. So the framing choice, as well as the decision to include white borders was all a uh, conceptual choice to make sure that the photos felt open enough and they weren't kind of like dark and that wasn't not what I wanted because ultimately this project is one about hopefulness because in light of all of these things that I was going through, the common theme is continuing to go forward, continuing to be interested, to be inspired, and to look, and to, you know, have that interaction with people. You know, it's like if I make a photograph of someone, there is genuinely something about them that I am inspired by, that I am enamored with, and I hope that that is in some way gratifying to them. And it's, you know, like I said, it is a two-way um, relationship. And so, yeah, the, you know, I, I showed this with a small video because I think the moving image is also very in, um, interesting tool to this uh, kind of idea of storytelling and memory. So we kind of, the way that I worked with my good friend Ade, who's a collaborator, I mean, he helps me make the pictures. We've been best friends for a very long time. I essentially sent him the like, you know, um, longitude and latitude of a certain place. And I would maybe send him one or two photos I made there and I would want him to go and interpret this space himself um, as like, you know, another young black person to go into this landscape. What does your experience look like? Informed by our relationship, informed by your knowledge of my work. And we work, you know, very symbiotically like that. And so he helped me to create a video piece that we made a, a soundscape for. So when you stand in the exhibition, you're able to put on headphones and look around. And as the music changes, as what is on the screen in front of you changes, your maybe your association to the other images changes. And that was a very interesting tool to kind of give it more than just pictures on the wall. Um, as well as a few found objects, because I'm also very fascinated in how these objects in Texas still exist where, you know, and especially a lot of this comes from the juxtaposition of moving to the East Coast and realizing the more, um, I guess, individual nature of where I grew up. Like, you know, if you grow up in a certain place, it's kind of hard to realize the individual intricacies of that place without getting some kind of uh, context to juxtapose it to. So where here, uh, things are very modern and space, this economy of space is different. In Texas, there's so much space, so a lot of the objects of this history are still present. And so there's like a material and haptic nature to what I'm interested in. If it's like an old leather on a spur or a handmade frame in um, an antique shop, like it's all getting at the same idea of memory, performance of history, and reconciliation with, the, with, the, with both of those. Um, so yeah, this this exhibition was really um, was really big for me because it was the only time I've showed this work, and to be able to you know be um, acknowledged that way um, for this project really felt like it, it truly was worth all of the hardship that um, happened along the way. These are um, a few assignments that I've done um, that kind of show how I use that same the same tools I learned making these two book projects to kind of uh, sustain a career in editorial photography. So this project is on Rosewood, Florida, and this was for Time Magazine. Um, and essentially, Rosewood, Florida was a town that was kind of systematically burnt off the map in 1923 by the Klan. And um, this was a very prosperous town. And this is a building that's one of the few buildings that still lies in this region of Florida that it would maybe slightly hearken to the history. Otherwise, everything has been decimated. I mean, this was a town with multiple schools, baseball teams, water towers, multiple mills, like a very prosperous town that was fixed on a steam railroad um, line. And because it was at the near the end of the line and they had a water tower, it was a very prosperous town to be in because of the frequency that the steam lines would go through. Well, there was a uh, adjacent town called Archer, and I'm going to try to abridge these histories, but I would definitely suggest you research all of these things um, in your free time because I think it's incredibly important that we do not forget this history, especially as we go into a more divisive political time and kind of seeing the way that some of these dynamics replay themselves. 
Um, Sherry Dupree is a historian and she helped to bring this story. Uh, she offers a tour where she takes people through all of the historical sites and explains them. And a part of this, so when they started to raid this town, which would happen for seven days, men and women would have to go through the forest to try to escape this. And p not everybody in the area was like, clan, you know, so there was people who knew that this was wrong. Even at this time, this would have been illegal. The government uh, would have issued martial law, but the governor was actually on a hunting trip when this happened. And it all started because of a false abuse allegation um, on the ha behalf of a white woman uh, alleging that an African American man had uh, assaulted her, um, you know, which is a common narrative throughout a period in American history known as the Red Summer. And so, um, this train, known as the Night Riders, would come through and would pick people up from this uh, section of this forest. This forest is known as the Devil's Hammock, and it's, they say that it would take like uh, the most trained outdoorsmen, I forget how many hours it was, but multiple hours to travel one mile due to the density of this forest. And so this was the landscape that they were trying to um, evade in the night. And so this is one of the trains, the style of trains that would have been around during that time. And it is memorialized in the town, not for the history of the Night Riders, but simply for this kind of um, pride for the steam line and this kind of Americana look at our steam line, look how industrious we were, and not for the fact that of this racial tragedy that had happened here. And this is typically the most emotional place for any of the survivors. You know, this is the place where people break down. Um, these were the train tracks that are no longer still above ground, but this is in Archer and this is at a depot. And so you still can kind of see that history and feel like what was there. This was the oldest living descendant. Um, she was 89 at the time of this photograph. She has since passed away. But her family, um, she was not alive at the time that this happened, but would be born a few years later. And so this is, and I guess I can say that this is one of the few times that America has paid reparations, if not maybe one of the only times that black Americans have received reparations for these types of um, atrocities. This was a house that was built, uh, that was bought by one of the families with that uh, money. But you know, it wasn't all just, um, okay, they gave us money, it's good. They didn't do it in a way to where the taxation and things were proper. So there was elders who lost Medicare, who ended up having to pay extreme tax spikes. Like it wasn't done in the most ethical way. And so this photo kind of represents the shadow of this kind of imperfect reconciliation that happened between the Florida government. And what I'll say is well, the only thing that, they, that won their case is because this kind of Floridian, Republican understanding of what's mine is mine, you can't take it, was maybe the only reason that this case won because that was something that these kind of far right, or I don't wanna say far right, but these right wing, um, you know, legislative, they could understand that like, well, that was theirs where in other cases you don't see the same kind of leniency. Um, this is the family who lives in the house, and so beautiful, incredible family. Um, you see the, one of the sons here, probably bored, you know, and I, I love, I just love this because if, you know, it's just kind of a universal family scene. Um, so not to put so much weight on them and just kind of, they're just a normal family who just happened to be a part of this, yeah, incredibly troubling history. Um, but they're so, so sweet, and I actually did, uh, graduation photos for the oldest son while I was there. So, you know, I think it's very important that like these photographs, they participate with them in a similar way as I was speaking with my earlier work, where it's like this can maybe be a part of their family album and it's a continuation of just family and not like this historical spectacle. Um, these are the case files for the case that they argued. And um, this is the lawyer. So she grew up, her father was a, um, the t the, an archer, was the small town doctor. So she grew up with a really close relationship to everybody in the town, black and white. And she always knew the wrongs that were done there, but it was an unspoken history. I mean, until about 2012, people weren't really like speaking about what had happened because it was literally such a culture of fear. And I mean, to this day, the memorial signs in Rosewood that uh, commemorate what happened there are still riddled with bullets by white supremacists who still harbor that same anger that was, you know, um, let loose on that town so many years ago. And so this next project is in my home state of Oklahoma about the Greenwood massacre, Black Wall Street. So I was in, um, approached by Kathy Ryan in New York Times Magazine and asked to do something around the centennial, the 100 year anniversary of the 
um, race massacre in Tulsa. And so this is Tiffany Crutcher. Her brother was Terrence Crutcher. He was murdered by the police in Tulsa. But she works with the Black Wall Street um, like memorial fund and they exhume remains from the burial sites and they help to bring back the history there. Um, and they, she asked that I include this photograph. This is the intersection where her brother's life was lost um, and kind of juxtaposed with these mass burial sites in Tulsa. So again, kind of speaking to how these these violence, all of this violence isn't necessarily just a thing of the past. And I mean, as of even last week, they're still um, exhuming remains because for a long time it was like lied about that it didn't exist in Tulsa, but there was a mass burial site from the victims of um, the Rosewood, uh, the Greenwood massacre. This is one of the survivors, her sister Randall, and her porch and house was actually renovated by Tiffany. So it's a very tight knit community. But even again, Black Wall Street has gotten a lot of grant monies, but even the way that the money is distributed has caused a lot of division and other things. And so again, kind of always a little bit critical of how uh, these things are kind of ultimately reconciled. And so they've been thrown into a, their own political whirlwind as the country has taken more interest in this story. Um, and this is the church there that has one of the only existing foundations from that time. The foundation of this church is the only thing that stands from the 16 blocks of Black Wall Street that were burned. Um, and you bombed, because yeah, they use World War I bombs to partially take out the town. Um, this next story is for National Geographic. It's about these two brothers and their fight to get a section of land back in Northern California that was taken by state parks. And so this is in Coloma, California in the gold mining region. Um, and so their, grand, their great grandfather, who was uh, a blacksmith in this area, he had a church, and yes, there's their twin brothers, and they're politically active in Sacramento, and so they are a bit affluent. And there's a foundation called Where's My Land that helps to get, um, you know, land that was taken through eminent domain back. Like one of the cases they worked on was Manhattan Beach, where they were able to get land back. And so this is the church that his great grandfather built, and you know, to have this still exist and them to have no claim to it is really pretty messed up. And so they're fighting with the state uh, park to get that back. And this kind of speaks again to this kind of willful forgetting that you know our country is very like prone to, as we can see. And so a part of my work is to kind of nod to that and kind of trying to justify that for that you know willful forgetting. That it's a term I often use um, to describe this phenomenon. Um, so, you know, this is a parody black shop, blacksmith shop that, again, has no notice of his grandparents. There was another family named the Monroe family who do not have any living descendants. And so they are the ones who are kind of immortalized as the black family on this state park where the family who has living descendants have not gotten any um, recognition or financial compensation for this land. Um, and so, yeah, it, I mean, it's in a beautiful part of California. And um, it was, this was a very, uh, yeah, fascinating story to work on. And this is a family Bible that kind of contains a lot of these records um, and kind of lay, you know, some substance to their claims of the rightful ownership of this land. Um, this last project, um, which was initially um, going to be published with The Atlantic, but now is being published through another publication um, called Granta Magazine, Granta Journal. Um, but essentially, long story short, because I definitely want to leave time for questions, um, this is a plantation called the McLeod Plantation in South Carolina, the Low Country, um, James Island. And so this plantation does not participate in any like reenactments or, um, you know, interpretations as they call them, which is like a very problematic thing that happens where people are dressed in clothes of the era and they kind of perform this history. Um, so, but they are thinking of how can we use this site as a place of reconciliation for this history. And so they have a writing residency that they do where they invite black American writers to come in and to do a residency here and speak about their experience being there. Well, the writer who um, I connected with for this, his name is Roger Reeves. He's a professor at UT, um, incredible writer and poet. And he did an article about his experience there. So he wanted me to come in and collaborate with him to make a series of photographs that spoke to this kind of troubling beauty that he found being within this landscape. And I mean, if you are a descendant of American slavery and you go to a site like this, it's kind of, there's no um, option to not have these feelings. And so even being there, making these photographs, working with Ade, my video collaborator, it was a very, um, 
yeah, I, I understood what he meant as far as this troubling experience that it is um, occupying this space. Um, and so, yeah, we spent about a week there photographing, getting oral history from people because uh, sharecropping took place on this plantation well into the 90s. Um, and you know, just thinking about the dynamic and psychology of the people who um, were enslaved here who literally like viewed the people in this big house as like holy because of how messed up the power dynamic was for many, many decades here. And so this was, a, this was a tough story, but in my opinion, it wasn't a subject matter that I was jumping to work on, but given the nature of the collaboration, I felt like it was, of, it was a conversation between multiple voices um, to make a statement about something that is extremely difficult to image and to, it's a very sensitive subject. Um, so this was taken inside of one of the like quarters, I, you know, enslaved quarters. Um, I even, you know, hate to use that term because this was a home for somebody and this was, you know, um, a place where people grew up. This was, um, so there was a woman who grew up here and she later on went to become a nurse. And one day she was called to come back to this place to care for one of the um, McLeod brothers who was at this point very old, ailing. And when she got there, she was so struck to see that people were still living in these small quarters that she started a ministry in giving back there. So this was left from when she would have converted this into a church of sorts. And in the back of there, you can see where belongings have been discarded over the years. Um, and so this really, really struck me to see this kind of stenciled um, proverbs and this kind of like just, you know, pulling for hope and pulling for um, light and life and love and spirituality in a really um, unimaginable circumstances. So this really struck, struck me. Um, and this, uh, these are my own edit because the magazine, like they weren't, you know, as fascinated with these inner individual narratives as me, but this is what, you know, working on these stories really draws me in. Um, and a part of the emancipation story here is that the people when emancipated by the union, they all went to the water. Um, and this is the sea where they would have walked to. And this is a sea that they, they had never seen. And so I was very moved by this kind of hopefulness again that goes back to again my personal work of like dealing with losing both parents very young and um, now losing all of my grandparents um, this kind of idea of the willingness to go to the unknown for the hope of better is just like such a, a theme and message that really struck me and so it was important to include images of the water all right thank you guys so much Okay. Uh, like a general question, like, oh, by the way, I love your work. It's, I'm a really big fan. Um, but like about the industry, like how did you sort of like gain exposure? Um, like more, was it just talking to like more people learning things? Like how did you like start to get like jobs and do you, do, are you like a full-time photographer or like do you th do things on the side? Yeah, so yes, I, I'm fortunate enough to do photography full time. Um, and that was maybe around 2020 was when I went full freelance as just a working photographer. Before that, I was assisting um, commercial photographers. And so I would, you know, if, it, if I would maybe have, you know, a day of six days of like assisting work, like two days here with this person. And it wasn't always exciting. Some days it was like underwear, e -com, sitting on an apple box like just so bored you know um but that's not really a bad job it's like beats you know my job before that which was whole foods bakery um which was also cool i often say i worked at a bakery and then i tell people it was in whole foods and they aren't as excited um but yeah you know i assisted for a lot of people and i would learn different things i would see one person shoot and i'd be like wow this person always exhausts their subjects every time they photograph them they just like photograph them till they're just like you know blank in the face and i don't i don't want to be that type of photographer this person never knows what kind of lighting they want they always just kind of shrug so like i want to know what kind of lighting i like and so working for different people but also you know a thing that i picked up from my grandfather who was you know people say Said about him after he passed that no matter the no matter the kind of hierarchy of person he was meeting from you know top to bottom he treated everybody the same and I think that that's like a really really strong principle that I'm interested in and often even as like being up here which is like kind of intense because I think that everybody in here is probably great and has a million great things to say as well it's like a weird 
dynamic, but I think that a test of someone who is, I don't want, I don't want to give myself too much credit, but to say like, an intellectual or uh, intelligent person should not make you feel less intelligent when you speak with them. And that's a, just like personal things that I really carried. So I, the reason I bring that up is because in, if you're working as an assistant, you might meet another assistant who is gonna go on to become an editor and is gonna go on to become this. And you're, the way you acted with them is gonna leave an impression. And so I always try to, um, yeah, just like be very personable with people and create relationships because I think that so much of photography is relationship based. You know, it's like I always tell students, I'm like, if you meet someone you really like, maybe don't show them your work right away. Like, just be cool that they're like having a conversation with you because that really goes so much further um, in this, in what we do. Um, and I think that a lot of people are annoyed by that, which is rightfully so because there can be shortcomings of that, of it being like, a certain click or it can have these other ramifications but I think that people really look out for um, one another in photography so if it's editors and like I said kind of starting that conversation so people I would meet through assisting editors um, sending out emails but also being very uh, studious of photography so studying different career arcs of different people okay this was their first show later they did this work and kind of just understanding how different people's careers function made it a little bit less um, personal you know it was like uh, I like to get as objective as possible because sometimes it's very necessary especially when like deciding is a photo is good or not it's like what do you mean it's not good like this is a photo of something so important to me and the ability to kind of like not be so personal about that is really important and so looking at um, the industry as for what it is, an industry that operates has an economic fun, like side to it, a creative side to it, and um, to have some understanding of like how to navigate that and how to, um, you know, how to maneuver through that uh, without like letting it like tear you apart, which I'm, you know, there's plenty of rough nights, but you know, um, that's kind of the, the thing that happens with, you know, choosing this path as an artist. And I think that it really helps if you are truly obsessed with what you do, because it's one of the few things that will justify the pain of being an artist, so. Um, first of all, I really, I really like your consistency of tonality that you use in your in the book. Uh, but the question I have is, do you have a back? What's the backstory on the image of the tattoo with the scar going through the heart of Texas? Mm. That is a very, very powerful image, and for me, it's the most powerful image in the in the series. Yes. Yeah, so this is the arm of. A good friend of mine, Jamaica Jones, and he was um, he was uh, peacefully protesting during um, the kind of uprising that was happening in Austin around police brutality, and uh, they used uh, riot munitions, and these were meant to be uh, bounced off the ground and shot into crowds. Well, he was hit with one directly, and it split his arm open right where he had a tattoo of Texas. And so my friend was then in a legal suit with the Austin police. He ultimately had to leave the city um, because of kind of intimidation tactics around the fact that his story was publicized. And so, yeah, he was, uh, he was struck by, uh, by a non-lethal round and nearly lost his arm during a protest in Austin. And so I made this picture of him. And he, yeah, you know, he was, uh, it wasn't someone who I heard about the story and found him like he was already a friend of mine for, for a long time. So this happened to someone who was close to me. Um, but yeah, this is, one of those, you know, in the, with this project in particular, it's kind of a story that I couldn't, you couldn't just write it, you know, and that sometimes makes it hard to follow up, you know, as I'm working on new projects now. It's like there is a quality of this thing that is like both timely of kind of what the uh, national psychology is going through, as well as like these things in the way of what happened to my friends, as well as what happened to my father. That's like a story like that could never be written. And so this photograph is, yeah, it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say it's great to be here. Uh, I've always admired your work. Uh, my question is, what is your relationship to printing in the darkroom? And is this something that's important in your process or your practice? Yeah, so the darkroom has always kind of informed my work. Um, in particular with this project, I was uh, 
you know, not the reason it's black and white, but one of the tools of using black and white film was that I was able to develop the film myself in a pretty like non-cumbersome way. Um, Cause you could do color at home, but it's just very toxic and the chemistry doesn't have as long of a shelf life. But being able to work in black and white, it gave me like this kind of like activity to do. So it would be like, go out and shoot during the day. I, like I got a two roll tank. So I'm like thinking in like increments of two, like am I gonna shoot two rolls? Am I gonna shoot four rolls? Like coming home, processing the film while listening to a podcast or having dinner. Um, and then, you know, ending my night with the excitement of looking at the negative of like, oh man, what did I get? Like, how is it uh, coming out? And then the next morning waking up to my coffee and scanning the images and then ultimately going back out. And that kind of kept the idle mind um, active in something because if you're a photographer and especially if you use film, there's like a very real like dopamine release <laughs> when you get like some film back. It's like really funny. Um, Cause like, yeah, it's just like so exciting. And I think that sometimes you have to lean into that. Like your week might be different if you make a picture that week. You might have a little bit of time of like letting something that rough happen, like slide off your back, or you might go into the room like a little different if you know you just got something good. And like, yeah, lean into that. Like it's literally like one-to-one, -one, especially like cause photography becoming like a tool of like um, addressing like depression or imposter syndrome or all of these like various like social anxieties we have being in such an unprecedented like space and society if there's a small thing that like brings you some element of genuine joy um lean into it um, not as like a crutch but as you know something that's going to be able to keep that like battery in your back um and keep going but as far as printing in the dark room i love printing i love printing a lot um but i'm definitely not the greatest so often um, like for example the book all the separations in the book are made from scans but my print style informed how we interpreted the scans um, and so yeah it's like now i work with printers and um at very various levels um, but i think that the dark room and this idea of like the object always has been like at the forefront of wanting it to be like a beautiful object and this kind of like you know some of the, my influences were also like master printers who printed for other people and made very like quiet photographs i've always been really into it um, i mean my favorite photographer his name is milton Rigovin, and he worked in buffalo um, for a long time and you know, he has this quote where he talks about his prints being masterfully beautiful simply for the fact that they need um, to be legible as art objects because that is a language that the elite understand. So how can I get them to be interested in this subject matter unless it is being brought to them in a form that they already understand being the fine art print? I'm not sure where he got that from or made that up at, but that is really good. And I'm not sure how true that is, but that kind of concept of like, um, technical mastery for another means and I mean I often you know there's a, a, a professor named Alan Governor who did a lot of research in Texas um, unearthing old negatives of uh, black Texans and one of the things that they spoke about was the people who were doing early yearbook photography in Texas they were like extremely um, they were extremely like uh, intuitive and like innovative in how they like printed so they would have like working photographers who would go out and shoot with these like five by seven cameras then they would go back to the studio and they everyone would invert their cameras and they would have ways of like printing like multiple images at once and they would make these beautiful prints and the reason that they had such a high level of technicality was simply on getting the customer to come back and so there's these like varying forms of like technicality and why they're important and like how they're tied to history that I find really interesting about the print. Um, but it's something that, you know, I'm always figuring out. I'm not in the dark room as much now, um, simply because I always say I only want one expensive hobby. And so exposing negatives is expensive enough. So like being in the dark room, like I don't, it's not like I like also shoot like 16 millimeter color film, like all these like antiquated expensive mediums. Like I kind of stick to one, which is like Tri-X negatives, FP4 negatives, um, experimenting with different developers and then when it gets time to like think about the final print then there's like another like set of choices to be made but I often think of it like monographically so it's like I will bring all these photographs to the same place when it comes time and, it, and in this with this project in particular there was photographs of all different sizes like some was four by five some was six by seven some was six by six so we kind of found crops so you see like there's these vertical images then you also have these horizontal images 
and that framework in itself cut down on what images would work for the book because it kind of had a shape that worked and it was like an editing tactic. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers the question. Like, I, I love the dark room, and I, I would love to one day have my own space. But as far as like presenting them as the final object, I'm like figuring that out, and as well as creating book separations. Like, I'm trying multiple different things to like have different voice, and you know, because to me, that's what it's all about. It's just a matter of expressing what it is that you want. I mean, even down to like camera choice and all of this stuff. It at the foundation should just be about expressing a feeling, and I think that it's important to like have that feeling because that's where voice comes from and not just like, oh, well, what's the best process I can do or what's the, you know, um, what it's X, Y, and Z person do, but figuring out like, what's your voice? Why this paper? Why this tonality? Um, and so sometimes the dark room is nice to get in there and be a little bit more hands-on. And yeah, I mean, I think there's just something special about like a, a silver print, so. Thank you so much. Hi, how are you? Um, great presentation. I just had a question. I was curious. Um, at the beginning, you say you came from a mixed um, parents, mm -hmm. a Chickasaw and African American, and I noticed you went towards the African American side and you developed that your your ideas through that versus the Native American side. So I was wondering, did you make that choice or? Well, I think that for me personally, um, especially living in Oklahoma. I was always read as being black, so that's initial, like that's always been my, how I've identified. Um, you know, growing up like in a very large family, like my father is one of seven siblings, so I always had a very like large black kind of um, you know immediate family. Um, and also the nature of photography and the native community is a very troubled one that has its own set of circumstances. Not to say that the history of uh, black American photography is not one that is also troubled when you get into like the daguerreotypes that were created at the end of slavery and all of these kind of forms of subjectivity and othering that the camera has done, but particularly within native communities, this taking as well as the fact that not, not that black American culture is monolithic in any way because there's so many people with different experiences, different backgrounds, different origin stories, so that is all to be honored. I'll, I often go back to this quote from Audre Lorde where she says, our problems don't come from our differences, but our failure to acknowledge them. And so that's also something in the book that I want to acknowledge is like the various forms of people who have different backgrounds, identities, sexual orientations, to not further write a homogenous story that writes somebody out of this kind of rewriting of Texas history. But as I said, the um, politics of making work about Native American identity, there's so many nations in this country, so the politics of making that work are very troubling. Um, and just really hard to, to like peel back the layers to. So you see in Oklahoma, there's not any portraits of people other than my family. And that kind of speaks to like that relationship. And so I, I make some photos now because I'm still active and going to powwows around the country. And you know, there's also a very large um, Afro indigenous community here in New York. Like, you know, there's so many black native people in Long Island and in the city. Um, who, you know, as well as like Florida, as well as where my grandfather's from. So I don't really think of the identities as one that have to live separately. Um, I think that, you know, you can't go in any American city without seeing native words. You know, much of our language in Spanish is all taken from Taino people, from American Indian people. And so I hope that answers the question. But yeah, I, I identify as, as black, so I don't really know, like, you know. I make photographs of people who I connect with and who I feel a commonality of a shared experience, um, but it's not really like limited. It's just more so I have a strong connection to that history given like my grandparents being raised mostly by like my grandmother after my mother passed away. And maybe that as well, the fact that I did lose my mother in middle school. Um, and you know, also my experience with there was not necessarily one of the most inviting. You know, in Oklahoma, there's twice the national average of suicide. Suicide is how my mother passed away. There is a very kind of predatory prescription problem that is perpetuated by native hospitals. And so it's not necessarily as prideful as a thing as I am to be, you know, as my feelings towards Texas. But very great question. Um, I hope that like answers the, the yeah, so you never pursue the, the, uh, the Native? No, I, my very first show was at MoMA PS1 in 2018, and it was of uh, Shinnecock people. 
Um, so yeah, and you know, I, I've been making some, I make pictures all the time at Native gatherings and connect with different elders. And you know, we have friends like, the, you know, we just recently had uh, Indigenous Peoples Day at Randall's Island and in Foxwood, they had a large powwow. But the nature of making photographs at the powwows, it's, it's, it has a history of people coming in taking photos and then going off and making money. I mean, it's like if you look at like Edward Weston's work or there's like a very troubled history there. And I mean, I actually just did a story, it's not here, but I just did a story on um, youth at Standing Rock and this, um, this kind of um, the American Indian Church, which is a whole other topic that's very fascinating. and I've been lucky enough to participate in ceremonies. Um, yeah, so I, uh, that, that story was for ID Magazine. I did a project in the Black Hills, which is where Mount Rushmore is. It's Lakota land that was taken. And so I did a project about this, this uh, group of youth who do this hike, and it's about them learning their um, spiritual practices from an elder named Hans, who was also their basketball coach. And you know, up until the 70s, a lot of those rituals were, or uh, not rituals, but you know, traditional practices were actually outlawed. So it's like pretty cool that they're able to do this. And maybe even some of the elders, they didn't necessarily grow up with this. Like they had to go to the darkness before coming back to the native spirituality and understanding that that is, there was no other way forward um, in, you know, Western society, Babylon, whatever we want to call it. So yeah, you know, it's not something that I don't make work about. It's definitely out there. Um, but as I, my background is more in sociology and I'm very much interested in black history in Texas. And I think that in a contemporary like uh, context, yeah, it's like the most fascinating thing for me to work on. Um, and there's, you know, not a plethora of people covering it. So yeah, it's, you know, it, they're, they're both there. They're both there. And I think that eventually I will publish a book of some powwow photos. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Um, hey, uh, I just want to say I really resonate with, like, your work. And it is, like, always been uh, just I felt seen through it sometimes. But um, I guess I just wanted to ask about this, like, theme of, like, reconciliation uh, that seems, like, prevalent and how, like, maybe going back to some things that, like, have been difficult, but, like, finding peace in the photos and like maybe how you allow for like space to like interact with those things and observe them and like capture them without like it becoming too like burdensome or too like difficult and like the process of like maybe going to like some ugly past or like you know even in your own personal life like visiting times that like have been difficult with your family and just like observing it through like the lens of like okay i want to like maybe like capture this moment and like maybe like not like make an end for it but just kind of like have some kind of like um what's the word like resolution there yeah i think that it's hard to foresee those types of things um i mean you know i one of my favorite quotes is like um uh, I'm trying to remember who said it was definitely like one of, you know, like a, a Robert Capo or like Cartier Brisson, like one of the old masters kind of thing is like um, that it, human beings are more important than photographers. So like it's important to show up first as a human and not just a photographer. Um, so that idea was very prevalent of like not just showing up because you wanted a picture or even if it's like a street portrait, like having this interaction only because you want to get like a portrait of this person. Um, but I mean, I guess, I guess like in regards to like, you know, um, some of the more difficult photographs to make, I guess the one in uh, particular would be the one towards the end of the book of my father. Um, you know, that photograph, I felt it was really important to make that because knowing that he was going to pass away, he also understood that it was like important for us to have some type of image of him. And yeah, there was like one morning where like we helped to like bathe him and get him into new clothes and like the spirit was good. And like, you know, I think learning, caregiving for a parent was really taught me a lot because he, I look a lot like my father and you know, as he got sick and seeing his body in like various forms of his illness, it was like kind of like seeing myself in a way, like the way his hands looked and the way certain things, it was like, it was difficult even at times to, to cope with that, like seeing him go through that state and like 
th relating that to how like his body is my body like and we are kind of connected in this in like interesting way as you know um parent and child um but yeah you know i I think that also in a way it makes it a little bit like easier because there's like this buffer between you and this difficult thing and I mean that's like inherent in photography and I mean even sometimes it can be a bad thing like you talk to like you know certain like people who work in conflict zones and they talk about how like there's this thing where you like go blank when you're working in these insane environments where it just becomes like this disconnected act of making the photograph and so maybe there was some of that there in work as well but I try to push it back against that but I think often of using the camera as like um, yeah as like something that is um, requires like some element of like even physical coordination you know to like be able to make a flash photo quickly to see the moment like there's like these dirty steps and I, I the thing that I often like uh, was interested in was like Edward Weston coined this term pre-visualization and so it's the idea especially these guys who are working with these big 8x10 cameras you would see the photograph before you made it um, and so I was often kind of interested in that and sometimes I would like, you know, if I'm going and I'm shooting somewhere, um, like sometimes, you know, I photograph at different like events or like public things. I typically like to go and kind of hang out and you have to learn to not hold any tension in your body. So like even though sometimes you might feel like insane or like what am I doing out here? I always say like if you're on an assignment and you end up like in a Burger King parking lot like during the best light and you just like don't know what to shoot like you're close to something like something's on the other side of that and like just being like what am I doing out here and there's so much of that in what we do and learning how to not let that break you but like understanding like it's okay and I would always be like you know if I make one photo good if I make no photos great and I'm kidding myself but having a little bit of that mindset to where you don't feel like so much like pressure but again kind of getting back to like learning how to not hold tension in your body like not getting into a space and then you're like the guy over there who's like arms are closed even if it's like slightly difficult being in like the presence of strangers or and I think it was a little different making this work with my family but as I make work in other communities um, understanding that it's like if you're the guest in someone's house how do you not feel that like inherent awkwardness and like how do you learn to like in your breathing in your body language like being okay and then kind of settling in, into that and that becoming normal there's like something in that process that i think is like important like you i mean i'm not going to speak for anybody but sometimes i feel like we go out into the world thinking that people are looking at us thinking the worst things that we think about ourselves and you have to remind yourself that that's not true <laughs> you know it's like it's like like if you're trying like a new haircut out and you're like walking out the house i think because this happened to me one time i like had like my hair out or something i felt really stressed and i walk out and as soon as i see it an old older woman says love your hair baby and you're like all right like i'm gonna be okay like her first reaction was not bad or that I look crazy or like, you know, so a little bit of that thing, like letting go of like those insecurities that you have for yourself and like being OK, like giving yourself credit and like, yeah. And I think that often, especially working with community, like people provide that for you, like, you know, when people open up to you and they allow you into your space and when they're grateful for what you do um, and your acknowledgement of them, like that in a way is like to become to me like just as important as the pictures. So. Hey, my What's name up, is Hassan. What's up? Uh, I used to be at Brow Park where you skate. Oh, Sport. word. Yeah. I've been following you since 2020. Love your work. Yo, thank you for being here. Uh, my, I have two questions. My first question is like, what got you into photography? Do you have any photographer background, like a member of your family? And uh, my second question is the detailings, because I th like seeing your photographs is like you you really care about details and so what what inspire you about that yes so the family album definitely was like important to me and i think that when you get into like a photograph like um the cover of the book i can pull it up here um let's see a photograph like this um this kind of speaks to this idea of like the haunted family album you know, it's like often, like my grandparents were together, like from my grandmother was 18 when she met my grandfather and they were together till, till the end. And I think there's like this idea of like that being like perfect, but then like to acknowledge like what hardships went into that, like in what ways was her potential diminished 
in which ways, because like, you know, we, that's a thing in an older generation. Like there was so much like abuse that happened within the family. But then you kind of look at the picture and like, you know, you say like, oh man, I wish I was back then. Like I would have loved to wear those outfits and like jam that music. And you kind of, like I said, you kind of choose what you remember, but you don't see like those hardships that happen behind that. And so oft, also if you're coming from a place of being, um, in a romantic relationship with someone who comes from, you know, a similar history and a similar story, like that history still haunts us. And so in a photograph like this, this is like in the, you know, in the antique store, you find a photograph of a photo booth of an old couple and your mind goes off to everything. And this photo is kind of like about the beauty of that, but also like the kind of difficulty of that. So seeing family photos, like, you know, I had a family on my mother's side who was a part of residential schools, which is like the native schools where they made all the kids go and cut their hair and kind of like took them away from their culture. Like I have family photos of great uncles in that kind of era. Um, you know, my, my great grandmother was like a child bride and there's all these kind of like troubling things in the family archive, as well as my grandfather who was, um, you know, um, in Vietnam during the time of integration. So he was a part of like the first black soldiers and he like rose through the rank, but what did that do to my family? Um, you know, to see him go through that, for him to witness what he witnessed. And I looked at all of his correspondence where he would write to my father and to my family from Vietnam. And he would always uh, head the letters to my dad, my dearest son. And so like, that was an early like title for this project. My dearest son was something that I thought of, like that idea um, of him writing that. And there was one image that really struck me where he had sent in a, uh, news, uh, a tearing from a magazine about some of the atrocities that were happening in Vietnam. And in his same cursive font on the background, it says, what do you think of this? And so his psychology, of being a part of this war where they weren't welcomed home because of the anti-war effort. And so all of these kind of, you know, juxtapositions of seeing this like black American family in Germany in the 70s, which I have photos of my family when they were like, you know, GI, like military uh, family all over the country. And so it's like that, that same thing where it's like you look at the photo and oft, also if you don't have those photographs, you know, not everybody has those documents of their family. So how photography also becomes this kind of thing of privilege. Like if you go into like an affluent, like suburban home, there's like professional photographs everywhere. Like, oh, there's them with the dogs at six and there's da da da, you know, and it's like that idea, in my opinion, gives you some kind of foundation because you look at those photos, you know where you come from. But even if you don't, I would spend, I still do, I spend a lot of time on archives and there's a lot of great archives archives available that you can find online. And so for me, being from Texas and Oklahoma, I look at Texas and Oklahoma historical archives and I'll type in any like keyword and just try to find a little bit of where, like, you know, to try to peel back the layers and really understand this place where the history is like so selective, like when what they wanted to tell you in the book history. And so that, that really fascinated me. And I really, you know, I, I try not to be virtuous with my work and like, I wanna shift the narrative of this. Like, no, I make pictures for a selfish reason, you know, first and foremost, and I acknowledge that because I'm not like a social worker or, so I, I don't try to move around the world with this kind of like, I help people see themselves. I, I none of that with me, um, but I, you know, in my most like, you know, hopeful day, I hope that like, yeah, my pictures of allow somebody some form of like visibility, even if it's like, you know, you take a photo of someone and then you bring it back to them and they're kind of like, you know, they like it or their friends are kind of messing with them. Like, damn, bro, you look kind of good there. Like, you know, and it's kind of this, like, especially when I photograph like young men, like I think, um, I mean, even like a photograph like this, this was three young men outside of a gas station. I was instantly struck by their white shirts and the twin brothers and I went to their um, mother and I was like, hey, I just saw your boys going to the store. I'm a black and white photographer. Is it possible if I make a portrait of them, I think it would be a beautiful photograph. And so they all come out of the store with like their hot Cheetos and like Slurpees. And she's like, yo, put that down. Like this, this man wants to take a photo of y'all. And they're like teenagers, like, all right. And I line them up and I make this photograph of them. And I'm like, oh, you guys look so dapper. What's the event? And they go, a funeral. And I was like, wow. So this is titled Brothers After Wake. Um, and I, you know, I offered my condolences, let them know that I had just lost my father and there's this kind of connection there. Um, also in a photograph like this, this is just a young person 
parked his car, playing music, they're kind of just hanging out. And it kind of speaks to like the boredom of these small places and how that kind of allows for like getting into trouble or going down like different paths and kind of just like looking at the beauty and like potential of the people and hopefully like, yeah, reflecting that back to them. Like every, whenever I develop my film, I always send the person the photo right away. I'm like kind of like, eager like yo check it out especially if it comes out good and then they see it they can post it on their social media I'm not like okay it's gonna be for a monograph and exhibition so keep it you know it's like they post it on Facebook or put some like blingy edit over it and I don't really it's like it has like another life to it um, and I mean in this picture in particular it was definitely like a, a kind of a Steinmetz riff because I love Steinmetz and he's made so many great photos of people around cars and this was kind of my take on like a Steinmetzian portrait and I remember pro like this I, I you know I saw him I took a photo of of him and his friends there was some that showed the car that's kind of in disrepair and I didn't want to show those because I didn't want it to then become about the car and like economics it was just when I processed the negative it was one I was like wow good exposure Two, this dude it looks like a model like he's like a beautiful young person and like you know I'm like not to say camera shy but I understand as a photographer I understand the power of photography and how you're a, a rendering an image of someone within your own imagination so I'm a little like skeptical of just anybody making my picture um, so I, but now that I'm getting older, I'm, you know, getting into my late 20s, like I can't get a super cool portrait of me when I was 23, you know what I mean? So it's like, I hope that these people have that going on, like these like great records of them. And yeah, to your other point of your question about like details, this is also in the same town. Um, so I think that like contextualizing the portraits, because if you have a project that's just portraits, it, to me, you get great projects. There's a lot of great projects that are portrait heavy, but to me, it's like always under this kind of uh, history of um, like the class and caste system, how like the like ethnographs, like ethnography and like um, this kind of othering that like this history of photography was like the person's like it goes to back to like August Sanders and like the social science, like very objective nature of photography. When I look at some portrait projects and it's just portrait, 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 it feels like an ethnographic study and not like a comment on a larger like human experience or social scene. And so I think that like having these photographs, but you know, you just farting around like making pictures under a bridge, you don't know what you know what I mean? It's like so many of the photographs in the project, and this is a, a funny story that I'll just share about one of them. You know, even like this photograph, this represents the first night that my father was hospitalized before he passed. Something drew me to photograph these with flash, and I thought it was gonna be a series, but it ended up just being this one image. So these details kind of hold different things. This is like, you know, a type of rim that's very uh, popular in Texas, and so kind of like showing like, the cracked ground, this culture, like the vastness, the sharpness, but also like, again, fantasy, like this is our, like this isn't all just in truth, this is like our own like, you know, film that we're making and it doesn't have to, like I said in the beginning, it doesn't have to be so tied to like these individual hardships. We can make a production that is truth, fantasy, we can do whatever we want to do. Um, and so I guess the, the funny one is this photo that a lot of people like. Um, and it's funny because recently I was speaking with uh, Gregory Halpern, I told him the story and he was like, oh man, you need to make more accidental photos. And I was like, thanks man. Like, <laughs> uh, but I was during the pandemic and I wanted to make a street portrait. I thought it would be really cool to get a, a good portrait of someone during the pandemic because there was so much distance between people and like everyone's masked up and like stay away. And so I wanted to get a portrait at this time and I saw this guy like kind of hanging out at this tire shop and like, coveralls like you know a little grease on the face like really kind of interesting looking guy and I go up to him I was like hey man I'm a you know local artist I make pictures about this area of Texas can I get a portrait uh, can I get a some photos here and he's like oh man go for it and I'm like okay amazing just stand right here and he's like oh man anything but me and I'm like all right great so kind of just as a joke kind of just like moping around I kind of point my camera over towards this thing and just take a picture of it and then whenever we went to sequence the book this picture became important and so, so you have to trust intuition because you're always going to be drawn to like the real big moments but also those small moments are so important and they're like very nuanced to get but it also requires finding a language to do that because like photographing these houses a lot of like the homes and structures that you'll see in the book oh, let's see if i can find one you know this is a part this is in the dunbar region of san marcus like a historically black part of san marcus texas that um Eddie Durham came from here and he was the first person to uh, make the electric guitar. A lot of people credit it to like the uh, the strokes or like other like late like early rock and roll but it was actually a guy who comes from jazz and big band. He played with Cab Calloway um, 
and he's like popularized a song called like Hit the Bottle. And but Eddie Durham comes from this region of San Marcos. There's also a church here that was like once burnt by the Klan and later rebuilt and has just now gotten onto the historical registry. But anyway, so you have this early context of like why you're interested in the area. You go in, you make a picture, and figuring out, you know, and this is a very obviously very um, new topographics inspired image. So this is a, a era of photography during the 70s, the new topographic, which was a MoMA show, um, kind of ushers in this canon of new American landscape. And so composition wise, I'm looking at something, I have a frame of reference, but this photo later becomes to me a metaphor for the financial burden that comes when you lose a loved one. And if their assets and their finances are all straight. And so, yeah, like it, they have multiple lives and ha being like open-minded. But yeah, I think that details are really important because to me, a good project that I'm mostly fascinated with contain these detail landscapes and portraits. And so they're all just as important, man, because you can't have like, just like, if you are, you know, and I, and I often like talking like music terms, like you gotta have the slow track, you gotta have the, the club banger, you gotta have the one for the, you know what I mean? Like you had to have the ones that hit different things. Like if you went all just like radio singles, like nobody's gonna really like dive into that album in the way that you listen to like certain albums where it's like the off song you really like, or yeah, you know, it's, it's all of that. Like really like what, what, did, what moves you? Um, but yeah, man, thank you for your question. Also, thank you for being here. Yeah, it's great to see you, man. Yes, I know there was one in the back as well. Yes, could, do you mind if we just do two more? I know that he has one yeah. in the back. I don't want to. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I am a student of uh, MPS uh, digital photography, and um, I saw some of your work at the beginning of the presentations were in color. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question is, how do you see the relationship between color and uh, black and white in your project? Yes. So I've I've worked mostly in black and white. I can skip forward to a few of color images. I, I think that I like color when it is used as a, a conceptual or narrative tool. Um, so black and white kind of helps because I'm able to kind of organize so much chaos of the world into something that's like muted because if you're making a color photograph the color of everything in the background is going to say something the color that the person is wearing also the type of light that you're shooting in is very important when it comes to color photography um, so there's a, another set of parameters like with the I can't stand to see you cry to mix in that many subject matters and things in color would have then added like another like layer of now the color has to be consistent. And so stripping away color allows you to kind of work with more subject matters in my opinion. And like yeah, color is not an, another element that you're using how I spoke like the shape of the photographs being like one thing, color would be another. But I think that color is really cool because it's inherently more contemporary. Like images are read as more modern when in color. And especially when speaking about some of these like historical elements. Um, let's see, I'll go down to see maybe one of these um, so some of these photographs you know also color again um, well, let's see Let me highlight them all um, sorry I should have a better a better way of doing this but um yeah you know I think that there's just always like different different tools for different projects I would love to do a series all in color um, but I have to figure out the subject matter that makes sense um, also the technical like things like am I going to do it on film which there's like very high cost of uh, color film at the moment and um, but yeah I think it's just a, a separate tool for like achieving something that you're you're interested in like storytelling you know there's so much things that you can do with like color and light um, but I like it to be used as like a tool um, for storytelling or evoking a certain emotion um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not partial. I also, a lot of the work that I look at is black and white. I really gravitate towards it. Um, but there's also a lot of incredible color work. Um, but, you know, it's not everybody can do both well. And, it, it, you know, it gets into a lot of different things. But again, with all of it, it's always like what tool is right for the project. And that goes to like camera. Like I'm not going to be on the ledge of like, oh, everything must be film or oh, it must be black and white. Like always open and another kind of thing that I do sometimes if there's work that I don't like after a while I'll try to go back and look at it and figure out what it is particular to articulate what it is that I don't like and most of the time I end up liking it by the time I look at it enough so that's another kind of practice of like 
or looking at someone you really like and really observing their images. Like, you know, um, looking at a particular photographer, look at their book and say, okay, well, I've noticed that they always kind of put the person here. They always kind of use this depth of field and you start to kind of understand their thinking. Um, and those things can be fascinating too because the ultimate goal with this uh, as a student and you know is to have a particular set of influences that inform your voice but then how do you shed those influences and make your own you know I have a lot of pictures like I said where it's like my Robert Adams photo or my like Alex Soth photo um, uh, Todd Heido photo like but how do you make it your own um, my Walker Evans pictures you know it's like you're always inspired. You're, uh, and a, a great quote is they say in photographer, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And so that's another thing that I'm big on is like all the people who have made work before us, like we're up against like insane circumstances and challenges. And so it's like embrace the fact that like what you're wanting to do with photography will never be easy. And like looking at that as like a rite of passage and how difficult it is to make photographs that can be read as, as art. Okay, we'll take one last question in the back. Hey. <laughs> nope. Good to see you, man. What's up? You know, I always appreciate your words and, and your thoughts on the medium. Um, I'm very curious. You talked a lot about, like, the art of sequencing and specifically sequencing for the book form. Um, I'm curious how that art and kind of idea of sequencing played into the role of exhibiting and, um, mm. and showing in the physical form. And I also have another question. Um, how are you studying right now? Like what, who, and just how, in which ways are you studying and still being a student of the medium and a student of photography? Yes, yes, no, thank you for coming, man. I, you always show up to all my, like, show out, so I appreciate you, man. But um, yeah, let me pull up a couple of pictures from the exhibition. Um, yeah, so we made like a small mock-up for this, like, you know, it's like the Derek Zoolander School for the Ants, like tiny model version of the exhibition where you get small photos and everything's like made at scale and to play with them on the wall at different sizes. Often what I'll also do is, um, because, you know, things can be, there's like no right answer. And I also work collaboratively with the publisher because, like I said, I think it's important to have another set of eyes on it um, that you trust. I think that it's also kind of bad to show your work to too many people, um, even though I'm guilty of it myself. Like I always say, like, especially if you go to like a portfolio, like everybody's like prints are like burning a hole in their box because like you want to show it. It's like you see the guy, he's like got the box and he's waiting in the conversation. You're like, all right, man, I know you want to bring these out. Come on, like, let's see them. And so, but I think that there's a damage and danger there, and especially I can talk about this with social media, where it's not a good litmus test. You might show something that you're so excited about to some person who just like hasn't had their coffee yet or is in a bad mood, they're headed somewhere else, and their response to it isn't what you're expecting, and that can hurt your confidence as an artist because you're like, yeah, I showed it to them, I could tell by their body language. Like there is literally like a particular like set of ways to look at um, photographs and to share them and so that's one thing to keep in mind like I can't just like walk up with like a new sequence of like unedited photos on my phone and be like yo this is my new thing what do you think like it's not it's going to change how you um, the response that you even get so I, even sometimes in when I go to visit with students like they'll show me work and I'm like I'm not going to comment on anything technical because it doesn't do you any justice for me to be like oh print looks a little cyan that doesn't even really matter like it's getting a little bit deeper um, but yeah, so sequencing can be like very like arbitrary. Like there can be some things that have to deal with um, like shape and like light. Like you know, th uh, that's really bad. But uh, <laughs> but like you know, this photograph being next to the detail, then it's kind of becomes these two moments of portraits paired with these two moments of details, and the center image becoming a little bit like more weighted. Um, the photograph of my grandmother being blown up again, following a sequence of kind of like portrait, non-portraits and kind of creating like a tempo. Um, and yeah, to, I mean, and that kind of connects to again, how um, you asked about studying. Um, Tina Camp is a great author and she has a book called like Listening to Images or I believe that's the, the title of the book. It's like Listening to Images, Speaking with Images, but Tina Camp, C-A-M-P-T, um, she's great. She has another book called Image Matters and um, really, really incredible writer. Also Nicole Fleetwood has a book called Troubling Vision 
which like has some incredible essays. One of my favorite essays in the book is about Teeny Harris, and he is a photographer from Pittsburgh who unmasked one of the, arguably one of the largest uh, archives of daily black life in America. He was a photographer for the uh, um, black newspaper, I believe it was called like, the Pittsburgh Sun. I can't forget the exact name. But he often would not make people into icons. Um, but anyway, I could expound on this essay. Essentially, she speaks about how this idea of iconography is actually damaging to like how we remember history. Because if you only remember MLK, I had a dream, and that's where it stops, that's a problem because you don't know about the intricacies of his legacy and the other political things that he was doing. And that, in a way, is a form of propaganda because you will remember the icon, the icon of the person and not the intricate, nuanced experience of them as an individual. And within that, we lose certain things. And so she speaks a lot about that in Troubling Vision, really, really incredible book. Um, Mark Seeley, Decolonizing the Camera, is another incredible title um, where he kind of unpacks this legacy of photography in a series of essays. Um, so yeah, you know, but also like taking it slow, like make a small goal for yourself. Look at it as studying, like also with like artist lectures, like there's a lot of great artist lectures. SVA actually has one that I studied a lot. It was Nathaniel Navir, um, Photojournalism and Ethics. And he does an essay, he does a three hour presentation where he takes you through a series of situations and he'll ask you, do you think it was right to make this photo or do you think it was wrong? And he kind of flips your thinking about ethics on its head and showing how like, nuance this idea of ethical photography is when do you intervene um, so those essays are all there's another great one I could just keep rattling them off but there's another great one that I want to say it was SVA it was Darius Himes and uh, Todd Hito uh, which was a really really great um, expansive conversation about his work um, so yeah, watching like, you know, YouTube lectures and then maybe if you want to have some structure, because I think that structure is important, especially like nowadays we like kind of have like an automated everything, you know, it's like pretty much like click here, whoa here, like get on the train. Everything feels so automated at a point. So it's good to implement certain things. And then another thing that I guess I'll kind of end on is this idea of being a photographer and not waiting for the editor to hit you up before you go do that idea you had. Um, or it needing to be a part of a class or some kind of structure, like creating that for yourself. And so, I mean, I, and I'm like, at this point, I'm only saying things that like I try to instill like myself, you know, kind of like my thinking about it. And I was trying to do this thing for a while, like writing 500 words a day. I didn't do it, but even if you fall off, like trying to get back on it, and maybe even if you start at 250, writing 250 words a day, because then when you go to do a grant application or a resi residency application, like, you're gonna be a little bit more in shape. It's like doing push-ups or you know something. It's like, if you haven't done it in a long time and then all of a sudden you gotta like perform, it's gonna be really difficult. And so if you've kind of primed yourself for that thinking, it's gonna be a lot easier to write grant applications um, in like setting that like kind of structure for yourself as well as if it's like you do one uh, lecture or two lectures that you watch online a week and you write down serious takeaways from them. And like I said, it kind of gets back to what I was saying about like understanding different people's uh, career trajectory and it will make it a little less personal because you can see other people's stories and it doesn't become so hyper fixed on like your own success or shortcomings and you just have like a little bit deeper understanding because I think that is, is very important. Like sometimes I speak with people in the industry and I can tell that their caring only goes as far as what they've worked on. The artist they show, the artist they publish, but I'm a true lover of all photography and trying to have like, um, yeah, a viewpoint because you know, um, if people are on the fence, they fall whatever way depending on where they're at. And so it's like having something that you stand on and believing in it is gonna be really strong versus like shooting to how you think the editors might want, but like actually having something that is your own and that you believe in. And even if it's not getting the most attention at the time, that's totally fine because the way this whole thing works is like, it's a constant cycle and like, yeah, there's definitely like space for everybody's voice as an artist. And yeah, if there's any takeaway, it's just like finding power in where you came from, no matter how difficult or challenging it is, and like understanding that that is a form of power and like that's where your voice starts. So yeah, thank you guys all for coming out. Seriously, it's been...